welcome you to the marriage series, The Tie That Binds. Today's topic is dreams and goals. And so as I think about dreams and goals, the main thing right now, or the first thing, is that you have a mission statement. Mission statements are very important because they define who you are and what you are about, whether it be uh, an organization, such as a church, or as an individual, or as couples. What is your mission statement? You know, companies and businesses, they have their mission statement. And I notice that those mission statements, they are all over the place. They got them up all over the building, so that as workers are going through their building, that they are always reminded, if not on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, you know, what is the mission of the company? What is it that we are all about? And so even though you may have very different departments within the company, that each department understands what it is that all of us together are working for, and that is the mission of the company. I serve a church, and our mission statement is to know Christ and to make Christ known. This defines who we are as a church. And so everybody, no matter what their gifts are and their talents, or what areas of the church that they're working, is that everybody is aware of our mission statement. The mission statement is simple enough that everybody from, from the young all the way to the old know what the mission statement is, but it also is a mission statement that is powerful enough that encompasses our whole ministry. But the mission statement also is a boundary and that it doesn't detract us from becoming something that we are not. Mission statements are very important. For instance, a church that does not have a mission statement is a church that's going to be in trouble because that church is going to be polarized because you're going to be people going in every which direction, whereas the mission statement keeps everybody focused. This is what we are about. And so that's where somebody that comes along and wants to be about something else, saying, well, you know what? The church's mission statement is this. You know, if this is not what you're about, then you're in the wrong place. But hopefully, for all Christians, that they understand that our mission statement is to know Christ and to make Christ known. And so, as I think about marriage as a church or as a business, is that it's very important for couples to be considering what their mission statement is. Joshua, he was a great leader. As we read in the Old Testament, he was a great leader of God's people. He understood what his mission was as far as being the leader of God's people, but he also understood what his mission was in being a husband and also a father. And so I read one of his most beautiful mission statements. It comes from Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so Joshua He's leading the people. He's a man of strong faith. He knows what is good, what is right. And of course, as a leader, you're only a leader if you've got followers. And so as a leader, he's saying, this is how I want to lead you. I want to lead you in the ways of God. And so he says, basically, I really don't have any control over your decisions, but I do have control over my family, saying, as for me and my house, in other words, for me, my wife, and my children, we are going to serve the Lord. And so as your leader, I'm being the example to you that you also will do the same, that that is the mission. That is the mission for, as Joshua is saying, that as the leader of the people, but also the leader of my house, we will serve the Lord in all of our our love, our strength, and everything about our person. And so I think about it as a couple. Think about what is it that you're about? What is your mission statement? 
What is it that defines who you are as a couple and what you are about? And so I have, you know, as an example of a mission statement for couples. We are children of God, called together as one for the causes of Christ. And so do you see that as being a mission statement? That we are called by God, we are brought together as one, and we will serve Jesus Christ in our lives. That that is what we're about, and that is what a couple will remind themselves of, hopefully on a daily basis. And so once you have your mission, esta mission statement established, then from there you start working on your goals. What is it that are good goals for your marriage? Because here again, if you set good goals then you're always working towards something. And when you're working towards something, then you're together. And when you're together, then a lot of the byproducts of that is that you are communicating. You're interacting. You are being married. And so it's very important that you establish good goals. And so, as you think about goals, Based on your mission statement, I think about what is written in Acts chapter 2, verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And so there are steps in goal setting. The first step is getting inspiration through prayer. Just as what is written in Acts, chapter 2, verse 17, that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be given visions and dreams, and that is so important. And that God is a God who comes to us in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit inspires us. The Holy Spirit helps us to dream. The Holy Spirit gives us dreams and visions. And so we read it in the Bible but hopefully that you can be a testimony to the fact that God does inspire you. And so that's the first thing, is that God inspires you. The second thing is that in that inspiration, God gives you dreams and vision for your life. The third step is establishing now the goals based on those dreams and vision. After some goal, a goal or goals are set, then the fourth thing is to find what are the ways and the means of now reaching that goal. How do I get there? And then the fifth and the final step is to actually see those goals uh, become reality. I've got this cup. It's my inspiration cup. What is my inspiration cup? Well, it's a styrofoam cup. And why is this my inspiration cup? Well, one day I was at a conference, and as I was sitting there, the Holy Spirit just flooded me with all of this inspiration. And as I was receiving all this inspiration, I was doing all I could to write all of these thoughts down. And these, all of these thoughts were uh, thoughts for writing a book. And so I was writing them down on, on pieces of notebook paper that I had, and as I filled up the, the pieces of notebook paper, then I thought, what do I write on? Well, here is my coffee cup. And so I just wrote down all of these ideas on my coffee cup. And then I got back to my office, and that's where I developed my outline and started writing my book, and then to see the reality of it, the final product, my book entitled River Reflections. And so what was a flood of inspiration became a reality in my book. And so you think about your life and, and how God is inspiring you and then set those goals and then work at those goals until they become your reality. I love trains. You know, I was here again, inspired by the Holy Spirit, called to be a pastor. But before that happened, my whole life ambition was to work for the railroad. Matter of fact, I had it all set up. My next door neighbor was a railroad engineer and, and he could get me in. 
And so as soon as I graduate from high school, that's what I was going to do until I was inspired by the Holy Spirit to go into the ministry. But still, I've got a love for trains. I still like to, to, to come up to a railroad crossing and watch the train go by. I've got a basement filled with model railroad trains, and I've got all this train memorabilia. And then I also enjoy cross-country skiing. Okay, these are a couple of my loves. Model railroad trains and railroad memorabilia, and then also cross-country skiing. Well, one day, I took one of my daughters to the, a train depot where my daughter was going to get on the Amtrak train. And as I, as I was standing in this depot, I saw this picture. It showed a picture of an Amtrak train going through the mountains. And here was this rustic hotel. But then it showed people cross-country skiing uh, next to the tracks. And I thought, well, this is really a neat picture. And so right away I was thinking, oh, wouldn't this be a nice picture to have on my wall in my basement along with all the rest of my pictures and railroad memorabilia. And so the ticket master was there and I started, you know, asking these, you know, I started making some comments and asking questions, you know, fishing. What I was hoping that he would say was, you can have that picture. And so I was just basically saying, how do you go about getting a picture like that? Where do you get prints like that? Boy, that's really nice. And he wasn't biting, he wasn't biting. But finally, the ticket master started uh, talking to me, saying, you know, that is an actual place. It's out in western Montana in the mountains. And he says, the Amtrak train will take you right to that place, drop you off, and there you can stay in the rustic hotel that used to be a, a place that would house railroad workers, but now it's been converted into a hotel. And then he said, you got beautiful cross-country ski trails that are groomed every day. And so right away I started thinking, okay, I didn't get the picture, but, oh, this place does exist. It looks like a place where I would like to go. And so after, as, as I got home, I was sharing this with my wife. And I said, how would you like to go on a train trip out to western Montana and there go cross-country skiing? And I had just gotten her some cross-country skis, so we went all cross-country skiing. And when we were done, she says, Jeff, let's go. And so I... I got a good package deal on, on the train tickets and staying in that hotel. And a couple months later, there we were, cross-country skiing and some of the most beautiful mountain trails. What was a dream now has become a reality. And while I was at that place, they had those prints for sale. And so now I got that print as a picture in my basement. But dream. That's couples dream. It's important to dream and set goals. Work to those goals. And when you come to that place where it is a reality, thank the Lord. And a lot of times when you get to that place where your goals now become a reality, God then will inspire you that based on establishing those goals, that from that, then you can set even more goals. I knew a man who... Upon graduating from high school, he went off to a university where he studied physics, and he got his degree in physics. Well, then he wanted to get his master's degree, so he went to another university, got his master's degree in physics, and then that led to going to yet another university where he got his doctorate in physics. And then he was hired by a university where there he taught physics as a professor for many years. But I started thinking about this. Is it that when we establish one goal, that that leads to another goal? Sometimes that's the way it works. Maybe his original intent was just simply to get, to go initially just to get his degree in physics. And then that led to establishing another goal. Or maybe his goal was to get his doctorate in physics to begin with, but knowing that he can't do it all at once, but he's got to do it in stages. And so that's so much about goal setting is that what is your big goal? And how do you get there in stages? Or maybe as you just establish one goal, then that leads to a greater goal, and, and then a higher goal, and, and so forth down, down the line. But as we think about goals in life, there are basically three 
types of goals. The first goal would be survival goals. And survival goals is just trying to get our basic needs met. And so these needs are such things as food, shelter, clothes, heat in the home, income, and health care. And so first of all, we need to establish that first level of goals, that first type of goal. Just basically making sure that you are surviving. Okay, once your survival needs are met, then you start uh, the second type of goal would be your personal goals. And so personal goals are kind of, you know, kind of worldly in nature. Well, not always, but a lot of times. Like for instance, I once set a goal saying that I'd like to qualify and run the Boston Marathon. Well, I was able to do that. I'm very thankful for those experiences of running the Boston Marathon. But that would be an example of a personal goal. And so as couples, you think about what are some of those personal goals, things that you'd like to do, whether it's going out and running the Boston Marathon together, or the goals of buying a house, buying a vehicle, raising your children, traveling, and having your careers going well. And so you think about all of, you know, kind of like your, your personal goals. But then the third type of goal, the third level of goal, would be purpose goals. In other words, what? is your purpose as a couple. How do you see your purpose as far as serving outside of yourself? How are you blessed to be a blessing to others? And so when your basic needs are satisfied and when you have kind of established some of your own personal goals, you know, things that mean a lot to you personally, but then also now looking outside of yourself saying, we exist for causes outside of ourselves, And so these goals are spiritual in nature. That is where God is inspiring you. Saying, oh yeah, running the Boston Marathon, or going out traveling, things like that. It's all good, but, but I've put you together for reasons beyond that. How do you serve your community? How do you serve your church? How do you serve your neighbors? How do you serve your extended family to see that you exist for reasons and causes outside of yourself? And so those goals are very important. Purpose goals. Once again, Abraham and Sarah, they had their purpose. God blessed them that they could be a blessing to others. And of course, the ultimate blessing for them was that, that they and their descendants then would give birth to the Messiah, who is Jesus. That was the great blessing. A blessing not just to the people of Israel, but to all the nations of the world. The Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Jesus Christ. And so the Apostle Paul, what he is talking about here, is that he is talking about the great goal. The goal that God has instilled in every one of our hearts. That is the great goal. It supersedes any worldly goals. And that is the goal to be in heaven. that that is ultimately what God wants for you, is that one day you will be saved, that when you die, you will be crossing over the Jordan River of death into the promised land, which is the kingdom of heaven. And that is the ultimate goal in life. That's the thing that is so precious about being Christians, is that life is journeying toward something. There is the ultimate prize. It's not like we just kind of go through life working hard and then one day we just kind of die and that's it. But no, there, there's rhyme and reason for life. That, we, that God says that, that, that there is a destination out there. In my Father's house are many rooms and I go and prepare a place for you. In other words, I want you to be with me, not only in this life, but also in eternal life. I have prepared a special 
place for you. And so as we think about marriage, our vow is, is that we will love each other until death parts us. And so our goal for each other is that as we establish our mission statement to live our lives for the causes of Christ and as we pray that God may inspire us is that couples are nurturing each other in their faith so that when that day comes and it will be a sad day when you will lose your spouse in, mar in death. But yet, there will be that spiritual satisfaction within you knowing where your spouse is. That your spouse has entered into the heavenly kingdom that God has prepared. And so, that's part, so much a part of the nurturing in marriage is nurturing each other in faith giving a strong faith to trust in the promises that Jesus has given to you concerning eternal life. But as you journey toward home, God's heavenly kingdom, that God will give to you goals that he wants for you to accomplish in this life as you journey. This life can be a very special journey. Yes, it has its hardships. But yet God has given to this life that we may experience the joy of his presence and to say that I've given to you purpose, purpose in me, so that you will live your life. That you will live your life for my glory and for my outcomes. And that is always the most fulfilling life. Now, as I work with couples in their pre-marriage counseling and I start saying, well, let's start goal setting. Based upon your mission as a couple, what are your goals? Now, here again, we can't, you know, a lot of times in life it's like, okay, these are our goals. We want to get this accomplished. We want this, and we want our goals to happen, and we want them to happen now. Well, a lot of times our goals are things that, that don't just happen all at once. Here again, we have to plan. Some goals take time, and so there's lots of planning, there's lots of patience, there's a lot of hard work. And so I'll ask a couple, saying, okay, what are some of your goals? Okay, and I say, Realistic, realistically, what are some of your goals that you can accomplish in that first year of marriage? And then I'll ask the question, okay, well, here's another goal, but maybe it won't be realistic for you to be able to accomplish it in your first year of marriage, but maybe this would be a good three-year goal or a five-year goal. Or maybe this would be a good 10-year goal or a 25-year goal. And so you kind of establish goals so that you're always working towards something. And here, like I said before, is that as you reach one goal, that sometimes then based on reaching that goal, then you start to develop other goals. But that's the whole thing is being realistic so that you're not disappointed saying, well, here's one of our big goals. You know, we, we weren't able to accomplish it in the first year. Well, just relax. Don't worry about it. Okay, if you weren't able to accomplish it in your first year, well, then maybe you can accomplish it you know, in your second year or your third year. But a lot of times I notice that when I'm working with couples, that it seems like the first... 25 years of marriage as we look ahead, that there are so many goals that just seem to be obvious. The goals of purchasing a house, raising a family, getting careers up and going. And so it just seems like it's obvious that as a couple gets married that they hit the ground running on trying to to not only set, but now to work on accomplishing these goals. Not with every couple, but with a lot of couples, that when they reach their 25th anniversary, that they, that they can now say, well, we've accomplished a lot of these goals. 
You know, we've now paid for our house. We have raised our family. We've got the empty nest. And our careers are up and going. And a lot of times now, for couples, they kind of look at each other. Well, now what? We've done well in the first 25 years, but now what are our goals? And here again, establishing good purpose goals. Maybe having some goals for retirement and so forth. But a lot of couples do struggle. What is our meaning? What is our purpose? And that's where those purpose goals are so very important. How do we serve? How do we serve in the church? How do we serve in the community? How do we help others? You know, if we just are continually thinking about selfish goals, well, yeah, pretty soon we'll run out of those goals and we'll look at each other. What's the whole point of marriage? Well, as I was working with couples who after 25 years of marriage were really struggling, I was really wondering, God, you know, what is the purpose for marriage after 25 years? Well, after a worship service, there was this really beloved couple. I mean, just a wonderful Christian couple. They have been wonder a wonderful couple throughout their whole marriage. After they were married, he went and fought in World War II for five years. And then they farmed for many years and raised just a beautiful family. But every day, you know, they would be nurturing each other in the faith. But as they were walking out of church, now as an elderly couple, they were leaning on each other. In other words, if he didn't lean on her, he wouldn't be able to walk out of the church. And if she wasn't leaning on him, uh, she wouldn't be able to get out of the church. But together, they were leaning on each other, and they were able to walk out of the church. And I just thought, that's the way it's been for their whole life, is that they've been leaning on each other. They've been leaning on Jesus. They're like two like an arch, two sides leaning of an arch leaning on the capstone that is Jesus Christ. Now I think about what is written in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. And so as couples, we lean on Jesus, who is that capstone. And in leaning on Jesus, leaning on each other, we can walk through life, reaching that heavenly goal, God fulfilling all of the purposes that he has intended for us in his wisdom and his understanding. Thank you for joining me. On behalf of the Lutheran Church of Peace, I'm Robert Snyder. Thank you for watching our program, and please join us again for To Know Christ.